All right, great. So officially, uh, welcome to another session of our PLD discussions. And in today's session, we are discussing recursion and recursive functions. And we are going to see how these are applied in our C programs or programs that we write in the C language. So as we do usually, I'll be using the board to illustrate things. Then I'll also use the compiler, the online compiler for the practice that we are going to be doing. So let me open a board so that we can start from there. So we are discussing recursion. So the first thing that should come in our minds is what is recursion? And from the previous sessions, I mentioned that any time a new concept is introduced in a programming language that you are learning, the first thing you want to know about it is what is it, okay? So you want to answer what is the concept. In this uh, case, we are looking at recursion. So you have to understand what recursion is. The next thing you want to know is why do we need this concept? Why do I need to know this concept, okay? And in this uh, case, why do I need to know about recursion? I hope you can all hear me. Sorry for <clears throat> the voice today. I can't really shout. I have some throat problem right now. Okay. Then after getting to know the reason why you need to know it, the other thing you want to know is when can I use this? Okay, when can I use this concept? So still in our case, we are talking about recursion. When can you use recursion? All right, then finally, you may want to know why and why not, or do I say why? Okay, when shouldn't, when is it, it is not appropriate to use it? Okay, so that's also something that you may want to know about any concept. When it is, it is inappropriate to use. So if you introduce a concept, at least if you don't know anything about the concept, you should know these three, okay? Then when you are becoming good at it, you should then focus on trying to find out when shouldn't I use this concept. So we are going to try our luck with recursion <clears throat> and try to understand what recursion is, why we need it, when can we use it? And eventually we would also learn when it is inappropriate to use recursion so let's start recursion when you talk about recursion recursion is more of an english word and all that it means is that if there is a given process and before this process goes into completion before this process goes into completion it has to call itself so there is more of a repeat of that same process before it can go to completion. That is when we say there is recursion. So all I'm saying is that recursion is actually an English word. And what it means is that before a process or any process at all, that cause itself before it gets to complete or gets to completion, then the whole process is called a recursion. Okay, so in our case, we'll be looking more of what we refer to as recursive functions. So if a function is undergoing recursion, all it means is that the function of interest will call itself. So the function will call itself before it gets terminated. If a function will call itself before it gets terminated, then we can say that that function is a recursive function, okay? And we are going to look at a lot, a number of them. Okay, so just uh, housekeeping rules for those who happen to join us for the first time. If you unmute yourself, we presume that you are going to ask a question and you are allowed to ask a question anytime, any. Uh, moment okay 
Femi, are you going to ask the question? Yes. So please, let's take note of that. If you unmute yourself, it means you want to either make a contribution, ask a question, or seek a clarification on something, okay? Because we don't want any form of disturbances. Then also, along the line, I'll ask a, a number of questions. And once the question is asked, you can unmute yourself and answer. We are here to all learn from each other, and it should be in a form of discussion. Okay. All right. So that is for those who haven't been with us yet. And uh, you're all welcome anyway. So let's continue. We are saying that a recursive function is a function that will call itself. So in the first place, we will have to know what a function is. Okay, and we've already had a session on functions and explained extensively how functions are created. So we discussed about functions. We said there are three main things about functions that we need to know. The first one is the definition of the function. The definition of the function. The second one we talked about the declaration of the function. Then we also talked about the calling of the function. Okay, so when we talk about a recursive function, what's actually happening is the normal functions we work with, you define the block of function, you define a function in the block of the function, okay, or the body of the function. After the end, you go and use the function somewhere else. So at a different location, you go to use that function. But when we talk about recursive functions, Inside your definition for the function, you are going to call the function in here. So the block of code that you are using to define the function, you are actually going to call your function in there. And that is what makes it recursive. And in order not to make this thing look so strange, let's try to relate it with things that we already know so that it becomes easier for us to understand. By now, I believe that every one of us knows how to delete a file in a Bash or Linux, let me say, delete a file. So someone should help me. What is the code or the line of code to delete a file in Linux? Yes, anyone? RM, then the file name. Thank you. So if I want to remove a file, rm and the file, the name of the file, okay? And this is going to remove the file for me. All right, thank you. What if I want to remove a directory? Let's say an empty one, an empty directory. How do I remove it? Yes, how do I remove an empty directory? RM um, um, minus R, then the, the directory name. Will the minus be necessary? The minus R, will it be necessary? Uh, in this case, uh, in this case, if it's an empty, you just use R, M, I, R. Okay. So if it's an empty directory. Okay, good. So if it's an empty directory, we can use RM and name of directory. Okay. Yeah. And that will remove it for us. So this is name of file. Okay. What if it's not an empty directory? Uh, in that case, you, you have to put the dash R. So what is the meaning of dash R? Uh, that is the recursive, the recursive flag. Okay, so you realize that this is not the first time we are meeting recursion. So this R is telling us to do this recursively. Okay, so we know that RM, that's what removes a file. So all that we are saying is that to remove this file, we are going to keep, because the directory contains something, we are going to keep removing the files one after the other until we are done, okay? So we are saying do it recursively, meaning when you go, you delete the file inside it, 
if you still have something inside, go ahead and delete it. So if we have a directory that contains subdirectories, which contains files, how will we delete that one? Yes, how will we delete because that one? Okay, so we'll still use our recursive with the name of the directory. Okay. So now let's make this practical. Let's try and appreciate how this works and how the request works. So assuming this is the directory that you have, this directory is made up of sub directories. Okay, there are quite a number of them. For now, let's just use two of them. And this sub directory is all made up of one directory here. And this directory is made up of files, F1, F2, this also contains some files, F1, F2, this contains F1, F2, F3, and the main directory itself also contains F1. Okay, so if this is the structure of the directory and this is the main directory, we want to delete it. So let's assume this directory is called bulk. Let's just delete that bulk. We want to delete it. All that we are saying is that if you pass, just remove to it. You are going to get an error that this is not an empty directory. Okay. So what it means is that your remove has been optimized to remove one file at a time. It removes one file at a time. So you would have to tell the command that's removed recursively. So if there is something in there, I want you to go inside and remove it one after the other. So when we pass remove with the hyphen R, that we are telling it to remove recursively. What this command will do is it will enter the location we pass, that's the name of the directory we pass. Then it realized that, oh, this is not empty. So now let me go to the subdirectory. What is there? It enters one of the subdirectories, finds that it is also not empty. So it goes to the next directory. Okay, this is also not empty, but it does not contain another directory. It contains just files. So let me go here, remove the first file. So it comes to remove this file. It will only do that if you are doing this work recursively. After it has removed this file, it goes on to remove another file, which is this. It removes this. Then it comes. Now there is nothing in here, so it's able to remove this. This means that even before this command runs, it's checking for a condition, and the condition is, are you empty? Are you empty? OK. So that is one of the conditions. Then the other condition is, are you a directory or a file? Okay, so I think it should check for that before you even check if you are empty. So first of all, it will check, are you a file or a directory? If you are a file, I remove you. If you are a directory, then the next condition is, are you empty? If not, let's go inside and find what is inside? Is it a file or a directory? If it is a file, remove it. If it is a directory, are you empty? If you are empty, remove. If you are not empty, go inside. So we realize that it is the same thing that we keep doing. We keep doing the same thing. So we are then removing all the files and the directories as well. Once we've gone through them and we've removed all the files in the directory, so we are now left with this main uh, directory that we called, and which is currently empty. So we can go ahead and remove it. So that is the concept of recursion. A process calling itself before coming to completion. So, the process will call itself before coming to completion. That's basically what recursion is. Any questions on that? What recursion is? Yes. All right. 
So one important thing that we noted from the RM recursive code or line of code that we use to remove the files is that it always checks for some conditions. It's always checking for some conditions. And we stated that, first of all, it was checking if you are a directory or you are just a file. Then if it finds that you are a directory, it goes on to check something we call uh, sorry, if you are empty. If neither of these is true, it's going to repeat itself. Enter that directory, then do the remove function again, which will further go and check these conditions if they are there or not. Okay, so very important in any recursive function, which we are going to be focusing on right now, in any recursive function in C programming, not only in C, anywhere you find recursion, it has to be a condition or you have to pass a condition. And mostly this condition should be conditions that will help us terminate the function when it becomes necessary. Okay, so here we are checking if there is a directory or there is a file. If there is a directory, we want to enter it and check again okay if it is a file all we want to do is remove it all right if we check and it's none of them then we are going to stop we are going to terminate this all right so that condition that kind of condition known as the terminating condition okay so termination condition the more technical <clears throat> Sorry. The more technical name for it is the base case. So we are now going to start looking into what recursive functions are and how we write them in C. But this is a very important aspect of it, the base case. So anytime you write a recursive function, you have to make sure that you have written what your base case is. Excuse me. So what we are saying is that anytime you are going to write any recursive function, the first thing you need to think about is what your base case will be. This base case is similar to what we are saying, the terminating condition. So on what basis will I terminate this? And it's very important for us to know that when to terminate it. Because if we don't terminate it, then our program is going to keep on running forever. So let's try an example. Let's try an example. Um, let's, let's just write uh, a function. Okay, so let's say a function called add and we'll pass an integer into it and all this function is going to do is n plus plus okay or let me say it's going to return return plus plus n let's say something like this okay this, this will obviously end, okay, because it will be called once, but I will turn it into a recursive function for us. See. So in this case, if I call the function, I'm presuming that everyone here knows how to create a function in C, okay? So I'm jumping into it, assuming that you all know how to create a function in C. If you don't know how to do it, you've already had a lesson on it, so just check the YouTube channel for the link to, I mean, the video on functions and revise it. Okay, so if I call 10, what's going to happen now is that this, my function is going to return plus plus 10. So what value am I looking at? Yes, anyone? 
Yes. What value will this function retain? I can't hear you. It will return 11. It will return 11. Okay. Because plus plus means we are adding one to it. So this will return 11. Okay. Now, let's assume that we modify this function such that now we have int add. We are passing an integer n as the parameter to it, or argument to it. Then it's actually retaining, let's say, let it retain. Uh, OK, so let's do plus plus n here, then return add n, please. Over here, I need you to open your eyes very well. I need you to open your eyes very well, okay? I'm trying to establish why it is important to always have a base case. And that's why I'm doing this illustration. And by that, we are already entering into recursive function. So let's pay attention here. We already established this, the normal function this. All the add does is that it adds one to the value that we pass it. But over here, we have add as a function calling add again. Okay. But before it recalls itself, there is an operation here, plus plus n. So which is similar to saying int add as a function taking n as arguments. The next operation is n is not equal to n plus one. Then we are retaining, we are retaining add of the new n. Okay, so there's a function. If I go ahead and I call say add two, Someone should unmute and walk me through what you think will happen. What do you think will happen in this case? Yes, anyone? All right. So I think the, I think this will keep on calling the same. Okay. So it's going to keep on calling it. Okay, that's good. All right, so let's see practically what happens. The first time you are calling this function, you call add two, okay? This means that this two, like we'll move to the blog of the code, uh, the function definition. And whenever we see and it will be replaced with two. So we'll now have two plus one giving us three. Then we are returning add three. So we have to go into the block of code again. This n is now three. And our next line of code becomes three plus one, which is equal to four. And we are returning add four. So we we'll still have to go back in here. N is now four. So we have four plus one is equal to five. And this is going to keep on occurring forever. Do you get it? So this is a recursive function because we have the function add calling itself. That is what makes it recursive. The function add calling itself makes it recursive. But this program is going to call itself infinitely so it's going to keep adding one to itself add one to the number add one we keep doing that over and over and over if you read the concept about memory location that we were given you would have come across something we call the stack memory or the stack okay so what happens is that when your computer is storing the 
these variables and functions that you are creating in memory, it does it in the form of a stack, okay? So from the beginning, say, when we started this add, n was equal to two. So it starts like this. We have this. Then we move on to the next stack. We have added one to two. So it has, n has become three. So we now have n is equal to three. So we'll move on to the next stack again. We have n is equal to four. We move on to another stack. n is equal to five. And we are going to continue like that because there's no condition for us to break out of this. We're going to continue till you have used all the memory you have in your computer. So this, don't forget that what we are trying to establish is why we need a base case why we need that terminating condition. Without a terminating condition, we are going to keep doing this, adding on the stack until we consume the memory that we have. So if you have a program like this and you run it, you are going to eventually end up with an error known as stack overflow error. So if you ever come across this error, you should understand why you have this error. You didn't bring any terminating condition or you didn't bring a base case. So at the end of the day, you have used all the stack that is available in your computer's memory. Let us not worry so much about the stack memory and the memory usage stack because we are going to learn them in later lessons, okay? Especially when we start talking a lot about the data structures themselves and algorithms actually would we'll look at all of these okay so let's not worry our heads around it but i wanted to point out that if you ever come across stack overflow error then it's likely that you didn't state a terminating condition the more technical thing i'll say you didn't stay your base case so to do anything at all the first thing you should think of is to come up with your base case. To create any recursive function, the first thing you should think of is to come up with your base case. Please let's pay attention to that. Okay. One thing you would have realized so far is that almost everything that we can do with recursion we can equally do them with loops. Almost everything that we can do with recursion, we can equally do them with loops. So for the ALS stuff that we did, we're told explicitly not to use loops, but we should rather stick to using recursion. That means that we could equally have used loops for it. So the question becomes, why should we then go for recursion? Even though it looks simple, a question, we aren't going to be able to answer it right now, okay? What is important is that we should know how to use loops. So whether you are using a while loop, a for loop, or a do while loop, just know how to use them then you should also know how to use the recursion, okay? At the appropriate time, we'll learn about optimization of our programs, especially when we talk about the data structures and algorithm. We are going to learn about what we call big O notation, where we'll discuss more of the efficiency of the code that you write. So we are looking at what they call time and space complexity, okay? So how well does the program that you have written, how well does it uh, use the space or memory? How well does it use your memory? And how fast do you get it done? So when we learn how, when we learn about the time space complexity of programs that we write, then you can then compare 
this same program, when you write it using the loops, what is the time space complexity? Is it larger than when I use recursion? So you will choose recursion when you know that the recursive function will give you a better uh, what time and space complexity. I mean, it will utilize the memory better than using loops. Okay, so that is when you are going to make a decision. After you've learned it, anytime you look at a code, you'll be able to tell yourself that, okay, this one has a big connotation of, let's say, this. I don't want to talk about them because it's not something we have done. But I just want you to know that there is a reason why we need to learn this. And the reason is that either the loops or the recursion, depending on the problem we are solving, one can be better than the other. And later, we will learn how to identify which is better. And this is how we are going to identify it. We use a concept called big O notation. And all it tells us is that how well we are using the memory of our computer, how well the program has been optimized to use the memory, and how fast the program is going to run. So we are measuring the efficiency. And if you measure efficiency and you find out, oh, using loops actually performs better than using recursion, then for that particular program, you would want to use loops. And, and if recursion is better, you would want to use recursion. So for now, all that is important to us is we need to know how to use loops and we need to know how to use recursion. Once we have gotten these concepts, when we have finally understood time and space complexity, we'll be able to choose the ones that we want to go with. But now, any problem that we are given, provided we can solve it, we can go with either loops or recursion. So what you can also try to do is almost all the problems that we have written so far using loops, you can go back and try to write them using recursion and see if you have an upper hand of, over recursion. Okay, so at least we've talked about the what recursion is, why recursion, and the base case, most importantly. And I've illustrated how recursion works using the remove code or line of code in uh, Linus. Okay, so now let's get more practical. Let's start with a recursive function. Any questions so far? Let me pick questions and you continue. Any questions so far? Yes. All right. So let's write a function. A function that's okay all right you i have to illustrate something before we start writing functions but let's see a function that adds um, all let's see all natural numbers up to n so we are assuming that we are going to pass n to it. So if I pass n is equal to 2, then it means this function will add 1 plus 2. If n is equal to 3, it has to be 1 plus 2 plus 3. Okay. If n is equal to 4, it has to be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. Okay. So we want to generate a function like that. But one thing. I've realized that it's a problem for many people when it comes to understand name recursion is the difference between a return statement and the print statement. Okay, so should, let's let's go back to our add function. Let me rewrite the add function. Um, so we had add integer n, then 
first of all, so we want to bring our base case. Okay, so let's check if check if n is greater than 10. So once n is greater than 10, we are going to stop. So that becomes our base case. Let's write if n is greater than 10. You decide what you want to return. So in our case, let me return, return say one, okay? Else, n is equal to n plus 1. Please forgive my formatting. Uh, I'm just trying to represent something. Then let's return. Return add. OK, so let's, all right. In the first place, let's return n like that, OK? All right. Maybe 10 is too big. Okay, it depends on the value we pass here. So if I pass add nine, if I pass add nine, let's see what will happen. This means that when we enter, so this will get into this definition. And when we enter here, n is nine. So the first thing is the base case we check. Is your nine greater than 10? No, if not, then it comes to the else block. So in our says a new n is equal to n plus one. Okay, so this is what n nine plus one. So that is ten. So we are going to return what? We are going to return add ten. That's what we are returning. Add ten to will come back into this function because we are calling the function again. Then it gets in here and checks. This is 10. If 10 is greater than 10, it's not. So it's going to enter here into the else block. Then a new n will become 10 plus one, which is 11. So we are going to return add 11. Add 11. After we have gotten this, we'll still come back because we are recalling the function. So enter, but this time around we are entering with 11. So check if n, which is 11, is greater than 10. 11 is actually greater than 10, so we are just going to return one. So what are we returning? One. So it means that when I call this function, as I called initially, okay, when you call this function, eventually it is returning one. So anywhere you call this function, what is going to give you is one. It's not printing anything to your screen unless you decide to print something to your screen. During last session that we had, I tried to explain the difference between print and the return. So always pay attention what you are retaining. Even though we've done a lot of things, we added one to nine to become 10, we added 10, uh, one to 10 to become 11. Eventually this function that we wrote ended up giving us just one, retaining one as a final thing. So if we decided to print something here okay let's say uh how do you call this function maybe i should go to the compiler okay let's go to the compiler and try it out okay so obviously we are creating a add function outside this, say add, then we are passing an integer n to it. Then let's define add. We said if, if n is greater than 10, what do we want? We want to return one. 
and then else what do we want we want to return add oh i think i've no, escape one line. We wrote and that we could have written plus plus n. Okay, but for the sake of those who do not still understand that, let me write it this way. So n is the original n plus one. Okay, so that's our new n will be the original n plus one. All right. Now we have created a function. And I hope you get this. We've created a function like that. We can come back here. First of all, we need to declare this function. So let's copy this and declare it with a prototype up here. Okay. Then inside here, let's say integer x is equal to add and let's add nine. Okay, so please, it's time for us to try and understand recursive functions. And this is where we are going to understand it. If we go ahead and print X, the question is, what exactly are we going to be printing? X, okay. Print F. Oh, sorry. Okay, great. So let's pay particular attention. And very important, I've already illustrated this on the board. Maybe I should try it one more time before we get here. Um, all that we have done is, now we have a function that we are assigning the return value to x, okay? So whatever this function will return, x will be equal to x. And we are going to print that value. So that's what we are looking for. Now this is a function that we are calling. So we need to know what the definition of this function is. And when we check the definition, the first thing it does is check if this value here, which we represented with n, is greater than 10. If it is greater than 10, it says that we should return what one but if it is not greater than 10 then we should return add n plus one essentially that's what we did okay because our new n was equal to n plus one so essentially that's what we did so if you pass nine the first thing it is going to do is is nine greater than 10 no so what will you do? We return add nine plus one. So we are now returning add 10. Add 10, 10 to is still a function. And we have to come back to the definition. Is 10 greater than 10? No. If it is not, then it means we are not going here. We are coming to this. And we are going to return add 10 plus one. So we are now going to get what? 11. So add 11 is what we are retaining. But add 11 is still a function that we are calling. So we have to go into the definition for that. And now we have n being 11. So it's 11 greater than 10. Yes, 11 is greater than 10. So we are retaining one. This means that at the end of the day, this function add nine will return one. So our x will be equal to one. Please, a few seconds for you to try and understand this. If you understand how this works, you should understand almost any other recursion problem, okay? This is what it is retaining. Essentially, we are looking for what it is retaining, but a chord itself. So that one, too, we are looking for the value it will retain, and eventually it's retaining just one to us. So if we go ahead and run this program, you realize that it prints one. 
no matter what number we put here, provided I think almost every number, it will run to against us one. So this program that we have written is actually not a very useful program, but it is to illustrate what recursion really is. Okay. So all the other addition that you did in there, that was not what you retained. You didn't retain that value, you passed it to a function. So that wasn't a point of interest. Okay. What is inside here? We decided to print n. What are we going to be having on our display or the screen? Okay, so if we decided that in the definition of the function, we are going to be printing n, then it's a different story altogether. This means that for the first time when we pass nine, when we enter, First of all, we check, is 9 greater than 10? No. But before the return statement, there was a print n statement here. But the n was, oh, I think I should create a new one here. So we started with this. I say add 9. The definition for add now is for, we are looking at add n. This is the definition. The first thing is to check if n is greater than 10. If it is, then return 1. If it is not, we want you to, so this is like the else statement. If it is not, we want you to find a new n is equal to n plus 1, then print this n value for us. Then return add n that's the new n okay so that's what our definition now has become and what i'm trying to illustrate right now is that there is a difference between the print and the return whenever you call a function it is the return value that will be brought okay but if you have a print f function in there it's going to print something to the screen. So anytime it runs, it will print that thing to the screen, but that is not what it's going to retain. Is, uh, I hope you are making sense out of this. There's a difference between the print and the retain. The retain is what is going to bring to you eventually when you call it. So when you call the function, what is it going to bring to you? It's not going to necessarily display to the screen until you decide that you want to print it to the screen. Yes, any question? But if you use a print, immediately that line of code is going to, is going to print something. So let's run through this and see. When we pass nine to it, nine gets into the block of code, checks if nine is greater than 10, no. So we won't come here. We will come into the the S statement. Now, the new N will be 9 plus 1, that is 10. So N is now 10. So we are going to print 10 on our screen. That's the first thing we are printing. Then after printing 10, we are returning add N. N is now 10. So we are now returning, we are returning what? Add 10. 10 will now come back to because this is our thing is a function the same function calling itself so we'll come back in here and check is 10 greater than 10 no. if it is not then our new n will be plus one which is 11 so we are going to print 11 and after printing 11 we are returning add 11. This add 11 is still a function. So we enter here, check, is 11 greater than 10? Yes, if it is, return one. So we are returning one. So this is the print results, but this here is the return results. 
there are two different things. This one, nothing is going to be printed onto your screen until you decide you want to print it. But this will be printed to your screen because you have printed it here. Any questions on that? Okay, so because I used, all right, because I used this, the new line in there. So if, let's start with nine, if there was no new line, it should have given us, okay, I still left space here anyway. And I think, okay, I'm printing the X here. I just want to illustrate exactly what we did, okay? So you realize that now I have, I'm just calling the function here. So what I've done here is that this function finally returned, the final return value was one, okay? So it means that our X will be one, but we haven't printed X out yet. I've commented this line out. So we haven't printed X out yet, but, during the definition of this function, there was print of n, okay? So that is what is actually printing the 10, 11, as I illustrated here. So we could also have said, okay, print on a new line. So that it prints them on separate lines. Any questions on that? Then we can also decide that, okay, let's get this printed out, the return value printed out. So if you print the return value out, this is the return value. Maybe I can write return value is, then you get to see. Any questions about that? We are now going to get into more useful functions using recursion. Any questions so far? So what we are going to do right now is I've actually written two functions already, two recursive functions already. And I want someone to walk us through what they think or how we are going to get the outcome or what the outcome is going to be for that function. Okay. Any questions? Otherwise, we move straight to that one. Questions? Okay, so the first one is talking about printing the sum of the first n natural numbers. So I illustrated earlier that that means that if I pass, say, uh, a to the function, I'm looking at that at 1 plus 2 plus 3, in fact, 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3, and gives me 6. If my n is 4, or if I pass 4 to the function, I should have 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. Okay, that should be 10. All right, so we are looking for a function that will do this work. But now let's focus on being able to update the function already, the recursive function already. So being able to interpret each step of the function. The moment you're able to interpret each step of these functions, then it becomes easier when you are going to create the recursive functions by yourself. Okay, so let's focus on that. This is a function. Please, let's all pay attention to the code. The first line is uh, adding the header file. Then here, the prototype for the function sum. Then we have the main function, which we all know of. We are saying that we are declaring a variable x and we are passing it to sum of two. Okay, so eventually we'll be printing uh, the x, the value for x. But let's get into the definition of sum. The definition of sum is here. Sum a, that is when you pass a to it. The first thing it checks is if a is less than or equal to one, and if it is, you should return one. So remember that what we have done here is what we call the base case or the terminating condition. So we are checking if a is less than or equal to one. If it is, return one. If it's not, we want to return 
a plus sum of a minus one. So let's get to the board. We are saying that the function is called sum and we are going to pass a number to it. So say n. The first thing we want to check is if n is less than or equal to one. If it is, we should return one. But if it is not, then we should return, what was it? I think it was n plus sum of n minus one, I guess. Let me confirm. Yes, n minus one. Okay, so if, this come to help me walk through this. If we get sum of two, Yes, anyone at all? Sum of two. Yes, anyone? Is there a lot of you here? One person should just unmute and let's go. Yes. It will be three. So, no, relax. I just wanted you to unmute and then we'll go through it. Okay, so we have sum of two here. What's the first thing we are going to do? Assuming we've called this function, what do you think is the first thing to be done? Yes. I think we will check the first condition. Uh, okay, so we'll check. Okay, so we've entered the definition of this sum, and the first thing we do is we check if n is less than or equal to 1. Is it less than or equal to 1? No. It's not less than equal to one. So we have to move to this block of code. Yeah. Then we are now having n plus sum of n. Our n here was two. Meaning the first thing we are going to retain. This is a retain statement. So the first thing we are going to retain, that is what you have to pay attention to. We are now returning two plus sum of what? Two minus one, right? So what is two minus one? That's one. But we still have this function that makes it recursive. So the function sum one has been called. So now we still have to what? Go into the definition back again. Okay. So is one less than or equal to one? Yes. Is equal to so, what do we retain? One. one. So we are going to retain one here. Once we retain one here, it, we have ended the block of code because there is nothing more inside the sum function. Okay. So once we have ended this, it means we can move this back to replace that. So where we see sum of one, we know what we retain is one. So we are now going to have two plus one, which will give us three. Let's go a step further. The same function, sum five. So please, to the rest of us, always pay attention to what the function is retaining. Very important, what the function is retaining. So for sum five, let's try and write the definition of sum here. Sum n, the first thing we do is check if n is less than or equal to one. Please, you can, you can mute yourself and let someone else, apart from the first two people who spoke, I want someone else or a different set of people. And let's walk through this, yes within one else we want to return n plus sum of n minus one yes please a lot of you here i don't want kindly on it and let's talk let's do this quickly Okay. All right, there are 
Sigito, you are not okay. Yes. Yes, let me see. So what's the first name? We have some five. What's the first name? The first thing is five. So it's will... so we'll start oh, everyone has me. Okay, so start with the first condition. Chiquito, no, you've answered yours already. So let's favor. Okay, favor, let's listen to you. So I said we start with the first condition. If five is less than equal to one. Okay, so if, if five is less than okay, so is equal less than or equal to one. It's not so it's not so we are starting with this and we are going to the next one is what we should return n plus sum of n minus one so n here is five plus sum of five minus one is what four four okay but this function is still calling itself so we have to go back to our definition so yeah. we check is four less than or equal to one it's greater than so move to the l statement Okay, the else statement says that we should return n in our case four plus sum of four minus one, which is three. Okay, we still are in the recursive function, calling itself again. We have three. So we we'll come in. Is three less than or equal to one? Okay. So get in here again, we have three plus sum of two. We'll go in, in again, two is greater. So we'll come two plus sum of one. We we'll go in this time round. Is one less than or equal to one? Equal to one, so return one. So we are going to return one. So this will return one. Okay. After you've gotten this tree like structure, you are going to be going back by providing the return results to the previous one. Provide the return result to the previous one. So over here, one was the last thing that was returned. So we'll provide one to this. So wherever we see some one, it is equal to one. So this becomes two plus one, which is what? Three. Then we are now going to return the results here to the previous step. So three plus two, eh, three plus sum of two. Sum of two here was what? Three. So it, it means that you are going to do three plus three, which will give us six. We are going to return the outcome of this to the previous one because they are calling some three over there. Then some three is equal to six. So we we'll now have four plus six, which is equal to 10. We are going to return the outcome of this sum four. So sum four, now we know is 10. So five plus 10, which is 15. 15. And we are going to return the outcome of this to this our function. Since we just called sum five, it means the outcome here or the return value for this function is 15. So if you wrote a function x is equal to sum 5, it means x is equal to 50. Thank you very much, Viva. Please, any questions? Any questions? I'll call someone randomly to walk mm -hmm. us through it. Yes. So you said no. Okay. So... That is the definition we have here. Let's run sum of two. Sum of two gives us three. That's what we got when we did that. Then let's run sum of five. Sum of five gives us 15, okay? So you should be able to interpret this on your own at any point in time. All right? Yes, any questions before I move on to the next one? 
let me randomly call someone to walk us through the same function walk us through how we are going to get some three some of three then we know that you understand uh the people who haven't spoken so far if you know you haven't spoken so far just volunteer yourself and take this one yes so okay um for some okay, it will check mm -hmm. if okay let's say some end we check if three is less than or equals to one if it is less okay, than so that was the one, first condition one. okay yes so it should return one else you should say three plus sum of three minus one okay <laughs> all right so that is the first thing so we start by writing sum of three then we are coming down to three plus what sum of what what sum do you say two. sum of two sum of what two is? yes mm -hmm. then it will work for sum of two is sum of two less than or equals this two less than or equals to one mm -hmm. no so it will come down and to do two plus sum of one mm -hmm. and to come back and say is Okay, n is n equals to one less than or equals to one. Yes, so it will return one. So it will be two plus one, the two plus one, and equals to two, and um, equals to three, which will go back to some two, and to become three plus three, which is six. Which is six, which will return to some three, and some three is six. Okay, thank you. So. When we put three here, three should give us six. Great. Thank you very much. I hope you all understand this. So, especially the flow, especially the flow, okay, how we went about it. So, you started from the top, moved down, then got the final return value before you are now able to estimate the return value for each of them. Please hold on, hold on for me. Hi, so sorry for that. I had someone knocking on my door, so I had to attend it quickly. Sorry, let's continue now. So as I was saying, it's important to pay attention to the flow, okay? So you can only get the return value for each of them when you know the return value for the very last one. So you always have to go down, 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 and get what the return value for the last one is. This means that if you are a recursive function that does not have a base case or a terminating condition, it means you won't get that's the last one. There's nothing that is going to be produced at the end. So you keep going on down, 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 down. So that's why it's important to always have a base case. Okay. The last thing that, or oh, is it last thing? The next example that I'm going to use is what we know to be factorial. So if I say two factorial, we all know that two factorial is what? Two times one or 
3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. How oh, that is it? So what you can see from here is that when you take 4 factorial, we have 4 times what we have here. Okay, that is 4 times 3 factorial. When you take 3 factorial itself to, you can see that it is 3 times what we have here, which is 3 times 2 factorial. Okay, so if I say 6 factorial, you can see that it's the same as 6 times 5 factorial. This means that factorial of n will be equal to n times n minus 1 factorial. And we should be able to do this. It's not like we should be able to. We are doing this recursively. Excuse me. We're doing this recursively, okay, as you can see. That's what is happening here. So for any number at all, we should be able to write a function that will do this for us. And for discussion purposes, I've already written the function here. And we are going to go through it, then see how the implementation is done. Okay. So there's a line adding the header files, this prototype for the factorial function. We enter the main, we are assigning the return value of whatever we are looking for. So in this case, factorial of five, the return value to A, and we are printing out A, okay? But let's look at the definition for the function factorial. We pass an integer to it, and the base case is for us to check if the integer is less than or equal to one. So this is our base case. Always important, start with your base case. Even before you are able to them, especially when you have been given a question that you are going to use recursion for, it's not like they've already written it for you and you have to interpret it. You are now going to develop the function using recursion. The first thing you should think about is what is your base case? After you've established it, then you can look at the others. So what we are retaining is, if it is not less than or equal to one, then we are going to retain x times factorial of x minus one. That's what we are interested in. So now let's try running through this code. Factorial of n, factorial of n, base case is check if n, is less than or equal to one. And if it is, return one. If it is not, if it is not, we are returning, return n times, n times factorial of n minus one. Okay, so someone who hasn't spoken today should unmute and help us out. If we pass factorial of four. Yes, factorial of four. Someone who hasn't spoken today should just unmute and let's talk. Please. You guys can be here and I'll be doing all the talking. But I'm struggling to talk right now, so you should be helping me out. Anyone who hasn't spoken today, just unmute and talk. Caleb, are you Caleb, there? Are you... Okay, go ahead. Once you've unmuted, okay, go, go ahead. ahead. Once... Yes, hello. Yeah. Okay, Caleb, okay, I'm can you, you help us? Yeah, can you help us? So, so the factorial of four will simply be four times three times four, four times yes, three but, times two times one. Okay, we know that, but we want you to walk us through 
using the function that we have created okay so right now okay. with this function and this definition this is the definition of the function so what's the first thing we do when we have factorial of four in this case okay just go to less than a minute ago so i'm trying to grasp whatever you're saying oh okay okay then yeah. that's fine all right so let's get another person too okay um we'll first check for the first condition okay so the very first condition which is n is less than equals to one so okay with in the part of n here yeah, is four okay. so is four less is four less than equals to one mm -hmm. return one which is no else okay we enter we enter that four times factorial of four minus one okay. which is three okay so we are going to return four times factorial of three three yeah okay what, then we move less again we we'll use three is three less than equals to one okay it, it's not so we use the else we return two two, two? yes it's two uh, as in two as in uh, i want to I want you to tell me the exact thing is retaining, so I'll write that one then. Okay. The fourth okay, thing okay. is retaining. Okay. The first the, the is we go when we go with three. Mm -hmm. Three there is three less than it. No. We now write okay. three. Write three times factorial. Okay. Three so, minus two. Okay. Three minus okay. one is two. Okay. Okay. Now we go back to the condition. Is n mm -hmm. is two less than one? Mm -hmm. Is not. So we return two. Two times factorial okay. two minus one, which is one. Uh huh. Okay. Now we now return with the condition of one. If one less than one, yes, it's return. So we okay. return one. Now we now use return. the one and add yes. Okay. That is so well, that 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 will give us two, right? Okay. So we now carry the two and add over there. Mm -hmm. That will give us uh two two that's four times four that is twelve. Which which one we are on this step? He said we are on this step. Yes, right? okay, okay, yeah, yeah, we are there. Mm -hmm. two. Uh -huh. So what will be the outcome of this step? That will give us four, four, four times, Abby, three how, times. How are you using the four? So you should remember two. that this is, is the outcome. So you are just replacing yeah. this. You are okay. replacing this with that what is you six. here. That is six. Okay, so that's three times two, so six. Yeah, that's six. And then we now replace this. Yes, that is okay. Okay, that is 12. Is it 12? Is that will it be 12? Yeah, that would be 12. It's four times six. So don't forget 20. 24. 24. 24. So that will be changed for them we turn it here. Yeah. So the factor of four is supposed to be twenty-four. Two times, two okay. Times, two times. All one, right. Which twenty-four. Okay. All right. Yes. Thank you very much. So from what we have seen, if we are given factorial of any number, let me use x to represent factorial, say seven. 
what it implies now is that since seven is no less than or equal to one, we are going to get seven times factorial of six. Then factorial of six is also equal to what? Factorial of six is equal to six times factorial of five. And then factorial of five is equal to five times factorial of four. Factorial of four is equal to four times factorial of three. Factorial of three is equal to three times factorial of two. Let me push it here a bit. Two times factorial of one. So at the end of the day, you are looking for the last thing that is retained, which does not involve the call of the function. So in our case, factorial of one will give us one. So it's not calling a function again. So we can end there. But each of these statements, you have to replace all of these with their respective return values they brought. So you start here, factorial of one, what is the return value? The return value is one. This means that in this R case, we have two times one, okay, which is equal to two. Then with the next step, we are looking at three times factorial of two, but this was the factorial of two. It gave us two. This means that this step, we have three times two coming from here. So this gives us six. That tells us that factorial of three is six. So wherever we see factorial of three, we have to replace it with six. So this line now becomes four times six. Okay, which is 24. This 24 will now come and replace factor of four because we found out that factor of four is 24. So five times that up to this end. I hope we understand the concept. Any questions on this? Yes, any questions? Please ask your questions. Uh, I'll be ending the session soon. I think. Uh, yes, any questions? If you are not asking questions, then I presume that everyone no. understands. Yes, Ima. Um, the 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 base case that we used. Mm -hmm. Is it almost that you the one to provide the base case, or maybe just like the previous uh, project that they gave us, they provided the base case for almost mm -hmm. all of them. What if they did not provide? Is it you that are going to provide the base case? Yeah, you are going to provide the base case. The base case. In fact, like if you decide to use recursion for it, you are going to provide it. Okay. The thing about recursion is that it's not even the thing about recursion. The whole thing is how maybe as a software engineer, you have a problem you need to solve. So you decide that, okay, I think the problem can solve recursively. Take it solve recursively, then what will be my base case? So let me decide what should be my base. It should be this. After you stage that, then what will be the next line of your code? Okay, so that's how practically is going to work. And please, to everyone here, recursion is a very important topic. And we all need to understand it, appreciate it very well. The reason is that it's one of the common questions that you get asked during technical interviews, okay? And if you are going to be asked during a technical interview, you are not going to be provided the case. You will be given a problem. So for instance, if you are given a problem that it writes a program that uh, finds sum of all natural numbers up to N, like we solved initially. So this first case here, a function that brings the sum of the first N natural numbers, excuse me, then you would have to determine what your basis is. Okay, very important. Yes, any other question? Okay, I want to 
Yeah. I don't know if you can use a since they say we shouldn't use loop in the last one. Can you use like any loop to do like one example or two? At least let's see. Can can I use what? Loop. To do one or one. So if if you want to use loop to do this. Oh, okay. So let's say for let's say for for loop. If you want to add the natural numbers, use the for loop. Even so, for instance, uh, is equal to four. You want to write a to add that is one zero plus one plus two plus three plus four. Okay, or you can even ignore the zero. With a for loop, you can start. You are given four. Okay, that's the end that you are given. So you can start by saying, okay, n is equal to the number that you are given, in this case, 4. Then you are going to condition if n is less than or equal to 1. Okay, if n is less, a, hey, <laughs> please so. That's how it writes less than or equal to I mean, the program. Everything like that. <laughs> if it's less than or equal to one, okay, then what you do is you subtract one from n. So something like this. And you write the block of code. So by then you would have declared maybe a function, eh, sorry, an integer called sum to be zero. Then now you can say sum is equal to sum plus n oh that should work okay so let's see i think the day will return some here that will be the same as this function that we wrote this function that we wrote so maybe i should try it here first In fact, with some technical interviews, you can have been in the loop from graphs to convert it into a recursive function. Okay, so you are giving the program apps to convert it. Because it could be maybe you met a particular program that was written using loops. Then when you check the time and space complexity of it, you realize that no, using recursion would rather be better than using the loops. So if that is the case, then you need to convert the loops into recursion. Sometimes to recursion, you have a recursive function, but you feel that the time and space complexity is better for using uh, when you use loops. So you have to convert your, your recursive function to loops. Okay? So it was a good question that you might ask. <clears throat> Sorry. Let me just try and copy this whole thing here. So we'll try. This is what we are trying to do. This is a recursive part, but we want to remove this and do it using a for loop. So what we do, say, we are passing A here, but let's say um, total. So let me define a variable total and assign it to zero. And then I'm going to use a for loop and say for a, because we are giving a, for a is equal to, sorry. So I can actually use any variable here. So let me use, in order not to confuse you people, let me use y. For y is equal to a. Then y should be, is y less than or equal to one? Then the next thing is y minus minus. Okay. So this a here is just representing the value that you pass here. So if you pass four, what you are saying is y is equal to four. Then I want to check if four is less than or equal to one. And after I've executed the block of code, I'll come here and do minus one. Uh, four minus one 
Okay, so let's write the content here. Total is equal to total, sorry, total plus, total plus what, y. I think that's what we did. Then eventually we want to return total. Ima, does this make sense to you? And any other person, if you have a question about it. Yes. Are you okay with it? Is which so question? Is, come again. Which question is this? So he's asking that we convert this recursion that we did here to add the sum of uh, the first n natural numbers to loop, using a loop. So it's just the same thing, but I'm no longer doing recursion. I'm using the loop for it. So when we started, I mentioned that suppose everything that you can do with recursion, you can actually do with a loop. So in this our case, we've been, been given a recursive function here. And we've been asked to convert this recursive function to a loop. Okay, I hope we get it. I have a question. Oh, sorry. I didn't, yeah, I didn't. Go ahead. I didn't call this. My question is that mm -hmm. recursion, it says that does it have a formula, a particular formula, or a particular method in writing it? Because the, in the form of you using that factor, yeah, you are making use of some some kind of um, n n plus um, n asterisk um, factor yeah, into bracket n minus one. So is it that that's just the normal basics in making use of recursion for factor? Or you can just start come, come, again, come again, come again, come again, come again. The factorial. What I'm mm -hmm. what, what I'm saying is that for that factor, yeah. That's mm -hmm. a, that's a, that the pattern you make use of, which you mm -hmm. make use of n asterisk factor into bracket n minus one close bracket. Okay. That particular that particular formula should we call it formula for factorial? Mm -hmm. Don't get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, should we call it formula for factorial in um, recursion? Well, I'm, I'm actually struggling with some things. I think uh, what is asking mm -hmm. the, each, uh, each arithmetic operation has some formulas. I think he, okay. what, what, he, what you need to explain is uh, the centers of the uh, the syntax of recursion and formula for each operation that you are doing. The syntax of uh, recursion, then the formula that you use mm -hmm. with the, the recursive uh, syntax to get your results. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. No. The formula, the formula, you know, he's talking so about if, formula, if formula for it, factorial. Yeah. Each, okay. Uh, okay. You, to get the natural number of any number, you it has a formula. Mm -hmm. Then to okay. get the factorial of any number, it has a formula as well. So he's asking yeah. if what you did is the formula for the factorial. Oh, okay. Which I... Yeah. Okay. So basically, if if like in the example where I was using factorial, like factorial in itself is an established recursive function. Like, I mean, how we come about factorial is already known. Everyone knows it. So it's easy to use that to explain. And that's why we use the factorial to illustrate recursion. Okay. It doesn't mean that. I, I'm trying to understand fully what you meant, but what happened here was that when I use the factorial, we all know 
that factorial is recursion. So we needed to use it to understand. But it doesn't mean you would have to, like maybe anything you are doing a recursion, you have to use factorial alone. No. But any problem you are solving with recursion, you have to find, like deep within yourself, you have to think about, okay, what is this problem? How can I solve it? So if I want to use recursion, what am I going to repeat? What's the base case? So you think through it and come with, uh, come up with your own function, uh, formula. But for factorial, we already know the formula. It exists already. We know that it is recursion. So it was easy for us to come up with it and use it. But we wanted to use that to illustrate uh, how JC functions work and how we can utilize them. Okay. So I don't I don't know if I answered, but if you are not, then you want to clarify your question better so that I'll I'll get it. That's it, that's it, that's just it. Oh, okay. All right, then that's good. All right, so I think there is a problem here. Um, uh, okay. 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 Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, but I can also hear you. Yes, but I can also hear myself. Which is very disturbing. Which is very disturbing. I can hear myself from your side. I think it's connected with you. Someone is using two devices. Someone is using two devices. He said, what is the best case for you? He said, what is the best case for you? He said, what is the best case for you? Linton, can you uh, mute your Linton, mic? can you uh, mute your mic? Oh, shit. Linton. Linton. Okay, okay, guys. Guys, it's okay. All right, so speak. Linton, speak. Let's hear you. Okay. I was asking, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, yeah, go ahead. I was asking, how do you get the best case for the square root task? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. All right, so he's, he was asking how did we get the base case for the square root test? All right, that's fine. We'll, we'll look at it. Yes, any other question? I think another person on mute. Any other question? Please bring up your questions. Let's try and finalize the thing. I think I'm getting weaker right now. Please, have you explained this particular one that I shared on your screen? Because I don't understand it. No, 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 no. I've not explained it yet. Okay. All right. Yes, any other question? Any other question? OK. So back to the screen. What I'm trying to do here is this case that we have that <clears throat> we are, uh, how do you call it? Um, say we are adding the sum of all the numbers. So if it is four, we are adding one, two, three, four. If it is five, we are adding one, two, three, four, five. And we have a recursive function here doing that for us. And we want to do it with a loop. Okay, so I'm trying to do it with a for loop. Oh, where is it? Yes, so I'm trying to do it with a for loop. That's what we are working on right now, okay. And let's see, think here because we are reducing this, eventually this is going to be, when, this is going to be zero eventually, so. Okay, that wouldn't be the best. Let's see. Mm, it's cons. 
So let's see. I need to get. So let's let's walk through it. Think through it very well. I think I didn't think through it well because we are subtracting. Um, hi. Yeah. I think, spoken. Use, um, I think we should use something like we should declare another mm -hmm. variable and n should be the number of the number one to get is some sum of like consecutive sum. So let something like for a is equals to one and a is less than n, a plus plus. Then some will be some is equals to zero and some is yeah. some plus come, equals come, to come again, come again, come again. Come again. Let me write think, it down for I think you should listen. you should declare variable a, declare any variable. Let from my case variable a, then variable okay. some. A okay. should be equals to one. And some a is equal to, to one. Okay. Yes, some is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. And in the for loop, in the for loop, okay, okay, we should have declared it inside the for loop though. Okay, for loop a is equals to one. A is less than less than n. Another variable n two years. It should okay. be clear variable okay. n. Okay. Okay. Yes. So this and will should we'll increment a plus plus. Then, we'll, then sum is sum plus equals to a. Okay. Sum will be okay. That should okay. work. Sum plus equals to sum plus a. Okay. So I think this should work. All right. So what what we'll do here is if our number that we are passing in is equal to four, then the first thing we are doing is a is equal to one. So we check is one less than four. Is if it is less than four, then we have sum which is zero plus one. Okay. So we we'll first get zero plus one. Then the next one because we will increment it here. The next one we'll Sorry. have a is equal to two. Yes. N. Yes, yes. That is not equal to that. So in the next one, we'll have A is equal to two. So when A is equal to two, we now already have our sum to be equal to one. So sum will now be equal to one plus what we have here, which is two currently. So that will give us three. Sum will be three here. Then we'll still come to increase a, a has now become three. So we have s is equal to three plus three, like that. So I think that should work here. Okay, so in that case, using this same example, we can sign this y is equal to one, then this less than a, then increment this. So I think the subtraction wasn't going to work because when we do the subtraction, eventually we are just going down, down, down. So eventually, we are just going to have y is zero. Okay, and let's return total. Return total. Okay. Wait, what was it? Four. All right. Let's pass four here. Let's four. So that is, is it. Like using the for loop, this is what we have for the for loop. Then this is what we have for recursion. Okay. So at the end of the day, these two will achieve the same outcome. So if we run some five and we run here some five. We are achieving the same outcome, a different code. So that's what I said that eventually we are going to learn to judge which of these two is better or more is efficient. Let me use that way. Which of these two is efficient? Then when you decide on which is efficient, we'll then stick with the one that is efficient. Okay. So there are cases where just as I'm saying, you go and this is the code that you have provided. And you are asked to convert it to, a, how do you call it, um, a loop, okay? So the practical example would be, let's say you are employed into 
a company as a new software engineer and you realize that oh the old code that they have is actually using something that is less efficient and if let's say it was loops but our loop is less efficient so you can use recursion to make it more efficient that means you are going to then convert all their loops in those centers to the recursion and vice versa okay so that is why it is important for us to know both ways so that at the end of the day when we learn how to check which is more efficient we can always choose the most efficient of them all right then i think the other question was on the base case i hope this thing will load um, let's see <clears throat> so on last the last the tax sorry the tax on what is it uh, recursion i came here to do most of them so i think the very first one was printing out something using recursion so printing out a string using recursion please i'm just going to go through them quickly so that we get to see the base case that's what is important in your base case is usually the most important then i think one other thing that you should also pay attention here which we talked about during our last session is passing pointers to uh, functions okay passing pointers to functions so here i hope you can see my screen <clears throat> in this case as you can see we are passing a character pointer here to this function that's output recursion then the first comment i have here hopefully you can see the first comment i have is define your base case so that's how i used to guide myself when i'm working what would be my base case if i want to print a string and if you recall from the last session that we did you remember that i said when you pass a pointer to a string what actually happens is that it gives you the address of the very first thing the first uh, in this that is in the zero or the first member of that array okay so what we want to check if for a string we know that automatically c will put the now character at the end of the string so i'm just going to check that this element that you are bringing is it the end of that character if it is the end of the character then i'm done okay so that becomes my base case i want to check what is the end of that character so if you want to print out all for now we know that put sharp prints out what there's a single character so if i want to use put char to print out multiple characters or a string a whole string then what i'm going to do is i'm going to check for each of the characters in that string array i'm just saying string array just to point to you that a string is actually an array okay so let me illustrate this if i have a string say uh, my name this is a string and this is actually an array like this so practically is an array so this is the actual representation in memory or something like this okay if you pass the pointer say pointer s what when you have said s is equal to this what you are saying is that you are passing the address to this one okay so at the end of the day this was just for the declaration if i want to dereference this i can do asterisk s when i do asterisk s it's going to take me to this okay that's the very first one is going to take me to that's the only thing it's actually going to be doing when i do asterisk s so i won't get any of these the only thing i'll get is this so i want to check is this a null character if it is then i'm going to terminate my function i won't do any other thing again if it is not a null character then i want to increase the address by one 
So let's go to the next memory stories area. I mean, for character, that's the next site. Let's go and look for what is there. Okay, so that is what you are doing here. The first thing you want to do, establish, is your base case. And in this example, our base case is when we meet the now character. It means we have ended. We have gotten to the end of the string. So that's the first thing we check. The value that we have right now, or the character we are pointing to right now, is it a now character? If it is, let's end our function. If it is not, then let's go to the next point in the location. Okay, so go up to the line of code. As you can see here, the base case was to check. So I wrote a comment here to check if you are at the end, at the end of the string. That was my base case to check if you are at the end of the string. And if you are, what I was doing was to print the next uh, line character. Okay, so that is what I was going to print using this putcha underscore putcha is actually a self-defined article uh, function. Okay, so for those who may be watching this later, if they are not part of ALS program, they may not understand this, but it's a self-defined function, which does the same thing as the normal putcha that we know. Okay, so here, that is the base case. That's it. But if we are not at the end, then what should we do? If we are not at the end, then we should just go ahead and print the character of that particular string. So we are just going to print. You see here, I've dereferenced it. The one that we checked, we checked if it wasn't a null character. So if it is not, then go ahead and print it. Then after printing this, I want you to repeat this function again. But before you repeat it, don't use the same address that you used initially. Add one byte to it. You get it. So here, the first thing I did was to check if O was end of character. If it is not, I've done, so I think preferably you should be using the plus plus S. So, so those of you who have been with us will appreciate why you use the plus plus S. Then the plus plus S means that we are adding one byte to the address. Please don't forget that we are adding one byte to the address. That means we are moving to this. So the next iteration of our function is going to be using S is equal to, as in the dereference value for S is B. And it's going to check if B is the end of line, or I mean, null character. If it is not, it will go ahead and print B. So this shall be printed O. We'll go ahead and print B. Then it will repeat this. Add one more byte to the address. So we'll move to the next location, E. Then we check E, end of character. Uh, hey, I keep saying end of character. It's E, not character. So we will print E. Then we'll come back again, add one to it. So we'll move one byte more. We'll get D, print D, come back, move once more. Then now we have end of character. So once we have end of character, we are saying that you should print new line. So we just leave this and come to the next line. So we are done printing the string using recursion. Any question on that? Using recursion to print a string. Yes. I'm choosing the wrong one. Computer is frozen. <laughs> Excuse me. Any questions? Hmm. This thing is frozen. Any questions? Please. The computer is frozen, so I have to refresh it. I mean, the platform is for you. Uh... Copy it to the other side. Come again. I, I didn't Can hear you. Copy... Right. Can you copy? 
can we copy the code like to the other side which other side i think i should copy it to uh the compile the other compiler is that what you're saying yes oh uh, it's it's going to be a bit challenging because i'm calling custom functions here okay so over here they have those functions but it's going to be a bit oh, challenging okay. unless we copy all of the uh, oh, okay. individual functions okay so let uh, me just walk you through the base cases i think that's what is important right now so yeah. here we are trying to print the reverse of a string using the base case you are trying to print the reverse of a string using base case in fact when you are working with strings whether you are using loops or you are using recursion the point of interest is the end of string so your base case will almost always be the end of the string unless if it has to do with something that has to do with the middle otherwise your base even to determine the middle you still need to know what the end of the string is you need to be able to count the number of elements in there. So when you are using a loop, you look through it to see what is the total number of strings there. But you are using recursion. So for the recursion, we will be interested in what is the end of this string. So in this particular example, I say check if it is the end of the string and print new line. So that is the base case I'm talking about, okay? So base case. In fact, when I'm done, I can share the link to this replex. So that those of you who are interested in it can take your time to go through it. <clears throat> okay, so all we are doing is checking if we are at the end of our string. If not, if we are, then we should print the new line character. Else, what should you do? Print the next character. That is for the reverse one. The reverse one is, is a bit tricky. It's a bit tricky because we are saying that you should first of all, <clears throat> first of all, check if we are at the end of the string. If we are not, then we want to do what? Use the, the same function on the next character. Okay? This one, maybe I should illustrate it. Can Okay, I think I can do something so that we'll use this to illustrate it. Uh, let's open a new one. Instead of using a custom function, use the uh, actual functions, okay? So we will use main.h. We use stdi.h. Then instead of underscore push, I will use push out. Uh, this will be a self-defined user-defined function. So we define that soon. Oh, okay. okay. So the function we have actually defined. So we have to create our main. Okay, then we are just going to call this function, call this function and pass a string over to it. So, or better still, uh, let me see, it's, let me pass Obed directly and see if it will work. <clears throat> I haven't tried it before. I'm always interested in trying things out. So. Segmentation for screen. I hope. Okay, let me let me go grab the main that they gave us for that. I think that would be easier. So we have the main here. Uh, where is that? Simply, I'm coming. Can you confirm something? Oh, where is this one? 
Okay. Okay. All right. So let's see what's happening. Let me, let me try and use this to explain. So as you can see, we've been able to reverse OBED to O B E D. Okay. So the base case was for us to check if we are at the end of the string. That was our base case for us to check if we are at the end of the string. And this is we checking. Are we at the end of the string? If we are not, then we get into this block of code. What do we want to do? We want to go to the next character. Let's try and reverse the next character. Okay. Before we come out to print the next character. I mean the actual character. So what, what's going to happen here is that when you take this one, we need to illustrate it. I've run out of space to here. We have Obed. The first one, so this is you calling, the very first one that you are doing, please pay attention here, what is it, the code? The very first, call that you are calling this function, okay? You're actually passing just an address. You're passing a pointer. So it's not the whole string that you are passing. Please pay attention to that. The first time you're calling this function, you're not passing the whole string. You are just passing an address with the pointer. And this pointer points to just the first character of that element. So it's just O that we are pointing to, okay? So we are pointing to the address of O. That is what we are doing here. Let me just call that function RP. So just representing the whole function. So we are calling RP of O. And when we enter RP of O, it checks if we are at the end of the string. If not, we are calling RP of, uh, how do you call it, B then we'll check if we are at the end of the string. If we are calling RP of E, we check if we are at the end of the string. If not, we call RP of D. Then if we are at the end of the string, beyond D, we will be at the end of the string. So RP of end of string character, okay? An end of string character will pass as a new line, okay? so. When we get here, from the code that we have, where is it? From the code that we have, the end of string is supposed to give us the new line character, but for each of them, we are supposed to print out the character, okay? So the character at that location. So this means that because it's a recursion, it's going to go on, but here we are going to print D here, okay? Before we get back here, we are going to print E. Here, we are going to print, what is it, B. Then here, we are going to print O. But remember that this will be printed before this, because this is how it is executed. If you remember from the previous ones, this has to be returned to this. Then this will be returned to this. Then this will be returned to this. Then this will be returned to this. So the D will be printed out first. Then when it gets here, E will be printed out. When it gets here, B will be printed out. And finally, O will be printed out. So that is how come we are able to reverse it. Okay. The most important thing here was for you to establish what your base case is. Then after establishing your base case, think about how you would be able to do this. Okay. So the trick, let me let me share like my thought process when I'm doing something like this is I use like the simplest case. So in order to come by this solution, in order to come by this solution to reverse this, I look at the simplest case. So what is the simplest case? If I have let's say two characters, O B, sorry. If I have OB and I need to reverse these two, what will I do? The first thing I'll do is check if O is end of character. If not, move on to the next one and go and print B. So that's the thought process. 
you're breaking the so recursion is basically like after you've broken down your problem we can solve each of the individual problems using the same process okay that is recursion so that is what we are doing here we want to reverse ob if i want to reverse ob the first thing i need to do is to check if the first one that i have that is o so let's say i call the function of o i want to check if it is the end of character if it is the end of character hey why do i keep saying end of character if it is a null character, I mean end of string character. That's how another way for it. A null character. Then I'm going to return a new line, but it is not. So if it is not, what do I have to do? If it is not, I have to go to the next one and print the next one because I want to reverse. So I have to print the next one before I come back to come and print the previous one. I have to go to the next one before I come back to print the previous one. That is how I will be able to reverse these two. So going forward to go and print B, we know that when we are calling, we call the address of uh, O. So let's say the address of O, we use S. S is representing the address of O. So if I want to go to the next one, I have to do S plus plus, or I mean plus plus S preferably. So I've increased S, I've gone to the next one byte. That means the value here is B, okay? And B, before I print out B, I have to print the next one. But the next one is a null character, so I'm not going to print it. Because it's a null character, I'm then going to print this B. Then send it back to the previous one. The previous one will then print itself. So that is what happened initially. We checked if it is now character. If not, then the actual function, the actual body of the function is let's call the next one and print out the original one. So when you go to the line of code here, this is what we are doing here. We are checking if it is the end of a uh, string character. If not, go to the next one. So this same function, let's repeat the same function for the next one. So the moment there is an end to this function, it will print at that particular point in time what x is or what the value of x is. So if our, it is our OB, then when it reaches B, it will first print B before it comes back to the O to come and print O. Any questions? I'm struggling. Any questions? Yes, any questions, please. Uh, we have to bring the session to an end. I'm, I'm actually struggling right now. But I have oh, all of these can ones I, here. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yes, please. Go ahead and ask a question. Yeah, so that my nice to be here. And uh, the, my question is that you, um, that function, the function itself is a uh, the, the test. The base case is certainly if. Um, um the the character the, the pointer to the pointer to the character which is a, a, a the string x is pointing to a new byte at the point where at the point where it's pointing to d i think d d to you is the end of character but now we are not the how, how, how is it working that uh, pointing to a new character at that point, now it hasn't got into it, it has not exceeded D. It has not exceeded D. It's here at D. So, and we are assuming that D is the last character to the string. So, now, but the base case is saying once the, the pointer is pointing to a new character, that means it has left that first position. And um, let me give an example of the, the agree, the agree, the agree, and the axie uh, concept. Now, if the axis is counting the uh, argument, for example, let me uh, talk about this string as argument. If axis is pointing at the number of arguments, what does it mean? The new byte, the, 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 the new byte, and let's see, for example, that the argument is five. And we know that the array will definitely go in the, in the four. It will not, not, not get up to five. So the last, the five, this is the new byte. It means that if you're pointing, if you're pointing to you, but it means it has, it has exceeded 
interfere the character, interfere the, the stream itself. So how can we check if something is very if you the point is very bad? And then we're not saying that the D is the last or end of character. So that that should be some issue. How is the end of character getting to a new bike? Okay. Um, and I'm not sure you get me. Let me, let me try to bring my thought together now. So my, what I'm asking is, um, how is the end of character D in the case of the stream of your past loading? How does this relate to um, the point that I send to a new bike? Okay. Okay. All right. Let me let me tell you. So the the first the first thing is kindly mute yourself. Like it's it's a bit noisy at your side. Please mute yourself. Oh, okay. Okay. Try to mute, mute yourself. My, my, my okay. 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 All right. All right. All right. <clears throat> Sorry. All right. So the first thing that I need to make mention of, if you have a string, obey. Okay. The end of string is not obe uh, D. So from the example that you were given, you were mentioned, you kept mentioning D as the end of string. No. So that's why I illustrated that the actual representation in the memory of the computer is something of this nature. We have, so if let's say we have some grid representing each bus is one byte, then what we have is O, B, E, D, then this. So this is what shows end of, uh, end of string. Okay, so that's what we are looking for, end of string. And before we started talking more about recursion, I mentioned the fact that we use the stack. Okay, so that is what happens, stack. So per the function that we have currently, the first thing to do is to check if we are at the end of, so that's the first thing, check if the address that you were pointing to, so S, if S, is actually or the value uh, the reference s is actually equal to end of character who has muted uncle m i think there is some sound coming from your end so kindly mute yourself okay good so that's the first line we are checking e if the value at this location, if it is the end of character. So for the very first time, when we check, it's not the end of character. The next line is for us to record the same function. So I'm just representing RP as the function. We are recording the same function, but this time we are doing plus plus S, meaning we are going here, like we are going to this place. So when we start, the very first one, we know that the value that we are actually comparing is, so the reference S is actually equal to O. Okay, so that's the first thing that we have. However, this is not what is done first. The next thing, before we even come out to print, before we come out to print this value O, okay, because there is, the last step here is print, uh, or it was put SHA. So put SHA, the current value of S, okay? So before we even come to do the put SHA here, which we are going to do, let's say put SHA of O. So let, let me just do it this way. We would first have to come to the next tag because we have called the recursive function again. We've called the function again. And this time around, the function is checking with the reference S is equal to B. And before we even come back to come and put SHA B, before we even come back to call put sha b, we would have called the recursive function of s item in the string array. Okay, so we'll move up here again. Then we now have character s is equal to what is equal to e. That's what we have. So before we will come back to come and print this thing, put sha c, uh, I mean e, 
would also have called the next string uh, items, which is the reference S is equal to D. Then before we come to put star of D, would have also called end of character. So end of character, once we have end of character, it's going to print what the new line. So we start by printing out a new line. In fact, it means we could have even gone without printing a new line. Then now we'll come to the next one. That is where we come to execute this picture. So D will be printed out. Then we'll come to the next one, execute this picture. E will be printed out. Come to the next one, execute this picture. D will be printed out. Come to the last one, execute, and O will be printed out. So we now have D, E, B, O. So that is how the stack works. Okay. If if you're able to visualize the stack, it's always easier for you. But sometimes it, it, visualizing the stack too becomes a challenge for people. That's why I didn't talk more about it. But if you use a stack, you know that once you are calling a function, until that is done, you can't execute the last one. You have to continue. Like we keep doing till so we get a final thing that has been done, they will retain the value. Retain, 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 and eventually the last one will be executed. So that is what was happening for our reverse string. Any other question? Any other question? Any other question? The question of square root. The square root. The square root. Yeah. Yeah. Where is that? Okay. So. To be able to get these things, they don't come like, it's not like something that, I don't know how to say it. I mean, this is something I had to go and do a lot of research on to get exactly what the base is. <clears throat> Even the actual function itself, okay? The actual function itself. So in my case, I'm saying that we are checking if n, that's the value that we are passing. N, if it's equal to, okay. So what what you have to see here is Ali. So this is what we were asked to do. Okay, this was what we were asked to do. But you realize that if you are using test that function, it's very difficult to get the recursion going. So you have to introduce another function that will be repeated. That will be uh, calling itself. Because the very function that you were asked to create, if you want to call that function, it's not going to work. I tried it a number of times and I couldn't get that going. So you have to create, sometimes we call it a helper function. So one function that will help you achieve the particular outcome that you are looking for in another function. Okay, so there's a function that we are looking for, but inside here we can't have the same function. We can't have this same function if that's what we want to achieve. So I have to create a helper function. And this helper function, that's what, sorry, what did I just do? This helper function will find the uh, square root of it. Okay, so I created a helper function called square root function. And what it does is it compares a given number to the square of various numbers recursively. So that's what I was trying to do. So if you give me, a number, say the number is uh, 21, okay? What I'm going to do is I want to create a function that will check if the 21 that you have given me, is it equal to, then I'll start one times one. If not, I'll go to the next one. Two times two, three times three, four times four, until I find a match, okay? So that will give me, like, that's the function that I used to get. Oh, okay. So this is the, uh, how do you call? This is the, will I say square root? Yeah. <laughs> so this is the square root. Because we all understand that square root is like, before you get a square root, that is the square of a number will give us that value that when we find the square root of, it gives us the, hey, today the, I don't know how to explain this thing. But I mean, if we have a number, say nine, square root of nine, we all know it's three. And the reason why it's three is because three times three is equal to nine. Okay, we understand that. 
So I wrote a helper function that will check if the number that you pass is the same as, and I start from one, and I go to check one after the other. So one times one, two times two, three times three, four times four, five times five, six times up to, the number doesn't have to be greater than nine. So if I go nine times nine, obviously it won't be equal to nine, okay? So that's how I'm able to get my base case in that function. Okay, so you think about it. What I realized, I did a lot of research to get, oh, is there a simple way we can get the uh, square root of a number? Okay, and I realized that the simplest way to get a square root of a number without any of the library functions that we already have would be for you to do it yourself by doing one times one, two times two, three times three. I thought about it. If you give me any number at all, say eight to one, eight to one times eight to one will definitely be greater than this. In fact, when I talk to it, it, I realize that even when I divide 8 to 1 by 2, the number that it will give me times itself will be way bigger than this. Okay, so I could use the half of this number as my base case, or I can use that number as my base case. So let's go into it. I think I should have something like that in there. Yeah, so here, uh, yes, so what, what I was checking for here is checking if s q is less than n okay so that was the condition i was checking for is s q that's the square is it less than n that is what i want so what i would have done is when you come up here i'm coming i'm trying to uh, yeah so we keep increasing this okay so when you call the function, you see here, inside here, I assign sq is equal to one. So when I enter this particular function, my sq is one. So the first thing I do here is one times one. I'm checking if n is equal to one times one. Then I'll return one. That is, if n is equal to one times one, I'll return one. But if it is not equal to one times one, the next thing I'm checking is if one is less than n. If one is less than n, then the next thing is to call this same function, but now let's increase one to two. So I'm going to check two. Then I'll do two times two. Is n equal to two times two? If not, then check if two is less than n. Then we'll go on. So let's, let's do the practical case for four. Say we want to find the square root of four and see what I'm doing there. So the first thing I'm doing, is I'm checking if four is equal to one times one. If it is, I'm going to return one. But if it is not, I want to check if one is less than four. Yes, one is less than four. So I change my one to now be two because I've added one to it. So I go on to check if four is equal to two times two. Yes, four is equal to two times two. So I can now return one. So I found my n. Hey, sorry, I can return this one, return SQ. So it's going to return one here, but this one will return two. So I'll find my square root to be two. Nathan, I don't know if you are answered. Yes, yes, please. Thank you. Okay. You have to meet yourself. Good. All right. So what's happening is that in all cases, you have to analyze the whole situation and find out what's the actual formula to do this. In the latter examples that we had, okay, you realize that for each of them, you needed a helper function, okay? But unfortunately, I, if I want to go through them right now, I'm, I'm going to suffer, I beg. Like, I'm not feeling comfortable right now. So what I would do is, you let me quickly do that right now copy the link to this uh sorry uh, this replets no 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 replets so let me copy the link to that replet so that you can all have access to it and go and check how i did it mm. recursion 
Okay. So for now, what I've been trying to do all the time is whenever they are given us, uh, we have a project, I come here to do them here, at least for the sake of feasibility. Then before I copy them to, no, before I go and re rewrite them in the sandbox. Hey, when did I post them? Video? Oh. Okay, so I want to go back to Telegram and share the link inside Telegram. Okay. Please, any final question before I go? Uh, link to Redlet on the various recursion tax. Okay, so I'll put the link in the group. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. No question. All right. Thank you all for joining. I hope I get better so, so that we can actively have our discussions. It's because I'm still not feeling fine. I can't really articulate myself much. But thank you all for joining. Uh, I think, is it Tuesday? I think Tuesday, Tuesday is a POD. So hopefully by Tuesday, I pray I'll be fine. Then. We'll continue. All right. If anything, we'll communicate in the group. All right. Thank you all for coming. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.